Good morning. Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to participate in this uh, very exciting uh, Coral Reef COE uh, workshop and apologies for having to uh, disappear. <laughs> As I said this morning, we're going to try and tell you a little bit about a groundswell of opinion that's really trying to move us, as it were, beyond uh, just simply studying ocean acidification and actually trying to frame it uh, in a, a, a broader context. That's the context of these uh, multiple uh, oceanic drivers or stressors. And so uh, to begin with, this is a graph I showed the early career researchers out of Mona yesterday. It's, it's my new favorite plot. It's got nine data points. They all come with error bars, which are the spines on the sea urchins. And what it's showing you really, I think, captures one of the big issues that's out there. And that is that uh, if, if we look down the, uh, the sort of left-hand panel here, we see the decrease in body size that is evident with the urchins as we decrease pH. However, when we put them into the context then of both uh, ocean acidification and also ocean warming, we actually see a zero sum effect. If we actually compare the, uh, the urchin here in the control with what we see down in the the bottom right hand corner we see uh, we're back to the same sort of sized urchin that we've that uh, warming has actually mitigated the effects of ocean acidification on body size and so we have to be very careful when we send messages out there that the sky is falling because of the effects of acidification on its own because you know the urchins in this case are actually experiencing uh, a wider range of conditions where other factors in the ocean are changing and of course, the conceit about this slide here um, that was kindly provided by Maria Byrne up at Sims is that there will be other drivers that we haven't considered here. And so just to simply say, it's a zero sum effect, uh, all, all, all as well, there will be no change with the sea urchins is, is also uh, naive and simplistic because uh, as we can see, uh, in, see in this next slide here, we're looking at a warmer ocean fresher ocean, a more acidic ocean, but because of the warming and the freshening, uh, we're also going to see changes in, in terms of the amount of uh, density stratification. So again, we can see that uh, the change in the density stratification is going to alter the supply of nutrients into the surface ocean. It's also going to alter the communication of the, the ocean's interior with the surface ocean, and so we're going to have changes in the amount of oxygen in the ocean, shifting horizons for carbonate solubility, changes in the extreme events such as uh, storms and also a shift in the light climate. And so if you're like me and interested in phytoplankton, uh, if you're rebooting their physiological flashcard, if we're changing temperature, CO2, pH, nutrient supply, light climate, trace metal supply, it's uh, really a big challenge to try and look at this. And of course then the other issue is that as we move from locale to locale uh, around the Australian EEZ, we see then this complex interplay of these many permutations of these stressors with local point source perturbations, uh, regional anthropogenic effects, and then some of these global effects. So we actually end up with a very complex matrix from locale to locale in terms of these, these multiple stressors. And we've known about this for, for, for quite some time. There have been a number of commentaries in, in, in some of, the, uh, in, in some of the, the journals. I've just highlighted a few here. Uh, people like Jean-Pierre Gattuso, Wolf Ribasol, uh, a, a number by myself, where we've sort of been trying to, to have, take a view and look forward to the next decade of research and, and really where we want to go. And certainly moving just beyond ocean acidification more towards this multiple driver research has, has been a fairly common theme. But again, as you can see from, from the, the bottom uh, headline, uh, there are many lessons to be learned from the ocean acidification community. They really have been the vanguard in, uh, in, in this debate, both in terms of the science, but also in terms of the policy, uh, the policy implementation. And so really to reframe the questions, there's two things that we really want to know. And the first one is, what is the cumulative effects of this complex ocean change from locale to locale? And secondly, we want to also then know what are these underlying mechanisms that are driving the change, because we'll have the individual effect of stressors, we'll have the cumulative effect, but we'll also have the interplay between the different stressors, as you saw on that slide of the, the sea urchins. But however, this turns it into a very dizzyingly complex experiment. If we stick to our old factorial matrix design, uh, if, if I want to play around with light and CO2 and, and nutrients and trace elements uh, and temperature, 
uh, it's, I'm going to need a bigger lab, I think, to, to, to run some of these experiments. And so we need a new approach, and uh, that's something we've been working on at, at IMAS uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, I'm going to talk to you this morning mainly about a paper which actually just came out uh, today uh, in, in Nature Climate Change, where we've come up with, I think, with a new uh, maybe way to, to, to tackle some of these issues. Uh, the first thing we do is uh, we use model simulations for our study organism, which is a subpolar uh, diatom. Uh, we get these from uh, a recent uh, re regional modeling study uh, to actually have a look at what the stressors might be. It turns out there's probably five of them for this diatom. We then go ahead and we identify the dominant physiological control for this particular diatom species for the subantarctic. We can basically then collapse the experiment down to four treatments, which I'll show you in a moment. And it's important then to use multiple diagnostics from conventional physiological metrics through to, in this case, proteomics, to really try and uh, uh, have a, a good look at what's happening, and then also use the literature to provide additional insights. And so really just to back up a little bit, we're, we're basically comparing two fundamental approaches. This is our, our approach at the minute, which is sort of the house of physiological cards, where we might have a single treatment looking at acidification. We might have a two by two matrix with warming or even three by three warming acidification nutrients. But as we try and build this card, we're never really going to find out what the cumulative effect is. There's always going to be a nagging doubt what did we leave out? We didn't look at uh, freshening. We didn't look at, at, at uh, radiance. Uh, was there something we're missing? And what we're uh, doing at the minute then is moving then to this more holistic approach where we actually throw the kitchen sink at the organism. We have these the five multiple stressors. But that essentially then causes another problem. It gives us this black box that we have to break into. We get the cumulative effect, but how do we, how do we uh, start to shake apart the mechanisms? And so we do that by identifying the ultimate uh, controlling variable. We then use statistical models to actually tease apart individual effects, in this case of temperature versus interactive effects. And again, we employ powerful uh, statistical models and, and multiple diagnostics. And so in, in, in our study here, we find out that from this reaction norm that temperature was what we're calling the putative dominant driver. Uh, this plot here of growth rate versus the maximum growth rate at, uh, at, at the sort of highest temperature in the reaction norm shows that uh, as we move from present day temperatures in subantarctic of just over 10 degrees up to sort of something closer to 14 degrees, we're going to see quite a large increase uh, in, in, in terms of the growth rate that's mediated by temperature. And so we've put that forward from these initial lab studies, that's the dominant driver. And then what we do is we actually collapse or group the other stressors uh, into one combined factor. And so here's our design. Uh, you can see we've got our control here. Uh, we then want to look at what's the individual effect of warming. So we've, we've, all, in this case here, we've just increased the temperature. We then want to look at the cumulative effect of all these changes. So we alter temperature, CO2, nutrients, iron, and irradiance, and then to actually isolate the interactive effects of temperature, the, the, the master sort of uh, physiological variable. We then look at this condition where we change everything except for temperature. And you can see then from these lines, we can actually then start to solve some of these, uh, these different uh, questions here. We can work out the effect of warming on its own, the effect of uh, a late 21st century ocean without warming and with warming, and by difference, we can then We'll start to work out what the, the different effects are. So onto some data. Again, co coded as in the last slide, we have our four conditions and just a subset of some of the metrics here. If we just focus on the left-hand side here on growth rate, we see that temperature, as we would have expected, gives us a, an increase in growth rate. Uh, if we throw the kitchen sink at them, give them the 21st, uh, or 2100 ocean conditions, we see we have an even greater increase in growth rate. And in this condition here where we change four out of the five stressors, we see uh, they don't like it very much. They really don't do very well. If we look across at some of the other metrics, we can see then when we start to look at uh, the influence uh, of, of uh, the cellular uh, nutrient quotas, we see that 
Again, in some of the treatments, we see a, an increase uh, in, in the cellular nutrient quotients, but uh, critically, in this treatment here, we see much lower, for example, cellular uh, phosphorus uh, or silicon. And that's important because in these treatments, we've actually decreased the nutrient supply by 30% uh, in the future open ocean treatment. So it starts to suggest maybe some of these changes here are actually uh, uh, helping to mitigate from uh, changes uh, uh, in, in, in nutrient supply on a future ocean. If we go to the next slide, then we can actually then use, in this case, five statistical models using AIC and partial R squared to actually unravel the individual versus the interactive effects. So the individual effects are in this sort of fairly lurid pink color, and we can see that temperature has, has a really big influence on growth rate. The other four collapse stressors have virtually no influence, and then the interactive effects explain about 20% of the changes that we see. But also interesting that we see that depending on which metric we choose, we get a, a different uh, interplay between individual effects, the effects of the collapse stressors, and of their interplay. So for example, for uh, the amount of uh, silicon or the amount of chlorophyll, uh, they, they switch quite a, a bit. But again, we think this is one of the first studies that's actually been able to, to break into what are the individual effects of these stressors versus what their interactive effects, their synergistic or antagonistic uh, uh, interplay, which again will vary depending on the diagnostics that we use. And then moving on to the proteomics, uh, here we have a differentiation of the proteomics across the four treatments. Uh, the proteome had about a thousand uh, proteins in it, and we used bioinformatics then to, to, to start to look at what some of the shifts were between the treatments. Uh, we can see here uh, quite some nice uh, handshaking between the conventional metrics. As I mentioned, we had decreased uh, cellular phosphate uh, in the 2100 ocean condition. And we see that this links quite well with a decrease in the amount of uh, uh, translation processes in the cells, uh, which is actually reducing the amount of, of, of uh, uh, cellular phosphorus which is needed. In contrast, when we look at this, this treatment C here, we see an increase in the amount of translation. And we also see shifts in terms of cell division control, in, in terms of uh, uh, upregulation of the photosystems, and also uh, nitrogen sort of biosynthesis. And this starts to provide us with some clues then as to break it into this black box. What, what are the real key, uh, key drivers uh, in this 21st century ocean? And so let's just go back and, and, and have a look at why there was such a big difference between these two treatments here. As you can see, they're, they're virtually the same, but all we've done is, 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 is uh, not warmed this, this treatment here, but yet we see a huge difference, which really quite surprised us. And we have three different reasons for this. The first one is uh, the individual effect of warming on the growth of this diatome. Uh, we also have from the literature prior reports of uh, the individual effects of both warming but also iron enrichment and growth. And then from, uh, from some of the molecular work, we see then the joint influence of temperature decreasing the need for phosphorus-rich uh, RNA. And also iron seems to offset the detrimental effects of, of, of a nutrient deplete future ocean. And we, we can then go into the literature and we can look back at some, some very old reviews, but very good reviews by people like John Raven from, from the late 1980s, uh, where they basically came up with a huge spinnaker table of, of, uh, of temperature or heinous uh, 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 factors and also, and also uh, activation energies. And what we find then is the double whammy that we seem to be getting here between uh, temperature but also iron seems to make some biochemical sense because uh, as Raven reported, temperature plays a key role in accelerating uh, non-enzymatically catalyzed reactions, whereas we know from work on trace metals that they have a key role in terms of actually enhancing enzymatically catalyzed pathways. And so taking both of these together, they're really going to uh, give the cell a big nudge by both enhancing non-enzymatically catalyzed and enzymatically ca catalyzed pathways. And then the nice thing we can do then is because we've taken a holistic approach, we can then come back and redesign a further set of experiments where we actually target the key drivers, in this case, temperature and iron. But we can do that in the knowledge that we have looked at all of the drivers and throw in the kitchen sink uh, at this uh, organism. And so in terms of conclusions, 
The cumulative effect of these uh, concurrent changes to the multi-stressors was actually positive for subpolar diatom species. Uh, and so that's, that's a, an interesting case of, of both winners and losers uh, in, in, in terms of different organisms. Warming caused the most beneficial effect uh, individually. Interactive effects explain between 20 to 50% of changes across a wide range of metrics, so you have to be careful which metrics you choose. Temperature and iron appear to be the most influential in, in affecting this change for a 21st century ocean, and so that lets us design further experiments and also explore some of the biochemical underpinning mechanisms so we can start to develop some conceptual models. And perhaps maybe one of the most important findings is that in our treatment, C, where ostensibly we manipulated four of these stressors, uh, we get a very different response. And so if we don't look at all of the stressors, we may end up with a very skewed view uh, on, on how it might influence uh, uh, the sort of things in the future ocean. For example, if we just done this complex uh, treatment C, I would have been sort of reporting that the sky was falling for these, these, these subpolar uh, uh, organisms. And so hopefully, as I say, we now come up with a, a, a new approach where we can actually start to tackle what's the cumulative effect uh, of changes uh, in, in a complex future ocean and do it in a holistic way rather than trying to build this house of cards where we're never quite sure if we've captured all of the players uh, because there's so many moving parts out there. And just to finish, I'll leave you with uh, a little bit of a, a publicity then for this uh, Ocean Global Change Biology Gordon Conference, which is coming up in the US and next year. We had the first one in 2014, and it was very well attended with a lot of early career researchers. Prior to this meeting, we'll be running a two-day, it's called the Gordon Research Seminar, which is actually targets early career uh, researchers. Uh, Dr. Chris Cornwall, who's uh, over with, with Malcolm McCulloch's lab at UWA, will be one of the co-chairs of this Gordon Research uh, Seminar, which is really a feeder for the main meeting, but it, it gives uh, our, our young scientists a chance to come and meet and talk with one another rather than standing in the corner at the posters not really knowing anyone. So I'll leave it there and take some questions. Thank you.